In this module, we will explore markers of left ventricular systolic function. This requires two-dimensional and Doppler assessment of the heart from both the mid-esophagus and transgastric imaging planes. As part of this analysis, we must consider that both contraction and relaxation are energy requiring processes and that a combination of both must be used to get a comprehensive assessment of left ventricular function. One challenge of assessing the left ventricle's function is that it does not lie in a completely vertical or horizontal plane in the chest, and thus descriptive terms like dorsal and ventral can't be fully applied to describe the heart's orientation. The images to the right of the slide depict the anterior and posterior surfaces of the heart, as well as its right and left margins. Note that the vena cava is oriented in a vertical plane, while the heart sits at a forward and downward angle in the chest. Complicating things further is that the axis of the heart varies from person to person, requiring some flexibility in the way each examination is conducted. It is useful to divide the heart into multiple segments for the purpose of analyzing ventricular function. Based on AHA and SCA guidelines, a 17-segment model is used. In this model, the heart is roughly divided into thirds from base to apex. Because the ventricle is not round, but rather bullet-shaped, there are differences in chamber size at differing levels. By convention, there are six segments at the base near the mitral valve, six at the mid-papillary level, and four at the apex, with one at the apical cap. Complicating image analysis further is the fact that by convention, the TEE image is displayed on the screen in a manner which is inverted both vertically and horizontally from the way the heart sits anatomically in relationship to the probe. Here we see how the image is obtained from the point of view of the probe in the esophagus and then rotated for display on the screen. We spend a significant amount of time looking at ventricular function in the mid-papillary transgastric short axis view. One advantage of this view is that it shows the distribution of both left and right coronary arteries in the same image and is thus extremely helpful in initial assessment of ventricular function. While a popular starting point, it is by no means the only view or method for assessing ventricular systolic performance. In the assessment of systolic performance, a number of views prove useful. As noted previously, the transgastric mid-papillary short axis view serves as a useful starting point, but must be coupled with other transgastric and mid-esophageal views to gather both quantitative and qualitative data. Although ejection fraction can be quantified, Practitioners often perform a visual qualitative estimate as part of the examination. Common quantitative assessments of cardiac function include cardiac output, contractility, and left ventricular volume or size. Integrating this information can aid in providing a complete picture of ventricular function. Calculations of left ventricular volume have a variety of limitations. They require assumptions about the relative symmetry of the left ventricle, which are not always valid. Errors in measurement may be compounded in the calculation process. To make measurements for volumes, multiple views must be obtained, and thus the process is time-consuming and not particularly useful in the busy operative setting. Fractional shortening is one of the quickest ways of quantifying left ventricular function. It is defined as percentage of change in left ventricular dimension with contraction. 
normal fractional shortening is 25 to 45 percent. It is simple and easy to obtain rapidly. It is limited, however, in that it is a one-dimensional measure and may not represent the whole left ventricle. It is calculated by subtracting the left ventricular end systolic diameter from the left ventricular end diastolic diameter, then dividing by LV end diastolic diameter and multiplying by 100. In this example, an M-mode image is used to conduct the measurement, but 2D images can also be used. Ejection fraction is the most common method for quantifying LV function. It expresses stroke volume as a percentage of LV end diastolic volume and takes into account the entire LV myocardium. It is calculated by subtracting LV end systolic volume from LV end diastolic volume, then dividing by LV end diastolic volume and multiplying by 100. By using stroke volume and end diastolic volume, it takes into account preload, afterload, rate, rhythm, and contractility. It has been shown in multiple studies to be a predictor of survival and operative outcomes. It is often globally estimated by trained viewers. Fractional area change is another approach to quantify LV function. The calculation is identical to that for shortening fraction, or ejection fraction, except that areas are used instead of diameters or volumes. Thus, similar to shortening fraction and ejection fraction, it is a two-dimensional measurement and may not accurately reflect the contraction of the entire left ventricle. To obtain the end systolic area and end diastolic area, the endocardial borders are traced when the ventricle is smallest for end systole and largest for end diastole. The papillary muscles are excluded from the cavity area. Area is calculated by the echo machine, and LV systolic area is subtracted from LV diastolic area, then divided by LV diastolic area and multiplied by 100. Other considerations in quantifying LV function include the analysis of cardiac output by calculating stroke volume and the assessment of contractility, which can be accomplished by examining wall thickening in systole and change from diastole. Mitral regurgitation can be a confounder in the assessment of LV function. Giving the left ventricle a low pressure place to eject blood may falsely enhance the apparent contractility or lower end diastolic volume, thus making apparent ejection fraction better than it would be otherwise. Volumetric flow can be determined by considering measurements of area and velocity. Doppler derived flow velocity over time, the velocity time integral, calculates the stroke distance. Cross-sectional area can be calculated from the LVLT diameter, which is measured with 2D echocardiography. Dividing the LVLT diameter by 2 yields the radius. Assuming the LVLT is circular, the cross-sectional area is defined by pi times the radius squared. The product of the cross-sectional area and the velocity time integral gives us the stroke volume. It is useful to think of the LVLT as a cylinder, whose area can be calculated by taking the cross-sectional area and multiplying by the length. In this case, the length is the velocity time integral, which is measured through the LVLT by pulsed wave Doppler. This flow signal is traced and the machine integrates the area under the curve, providing the length of the cylinder. The next several slides will detail how to obtain the images required to perform this calculation. Measurement of the left ventricular outflow tract diameter 
is conducted in the mid-esophageal aortic valve long axis view at 100 to 120 degrees. The LVOT is measured within 1 cm of the aortic valve with the walls parallel and the valve open. Since this number is squared in the process of calculating the LVOT area, it becomes the greatest source of error in the calculation. It is thus prudent to conduct multiple measurements of the LVLT to ensure accurate measurements. It is best to average these measurements. Reducing the depth of imaging can aid in obtaining better resolution and improving measurements. The pulse wave through the LVLT is obtained in the deep transgastric or transgastric long axis views. Here, the deep transgastric view is demonstrated. It is obtained by advancing the probe into the stomach and antiflexing gently until the apex is seen at the top of the screen, closest to the probe, and the LVLT and aortic valve are seen at the bottom of the screen. It represents an inversion of the usual way the heart appears in the mid-esophageal views. This view is ideal for lining up Doppler beams across the LVLT and aortic valve and is useful for calculations of stroke volume and aortic valve area. In this slide, we have assembled all of the information required to calculate stroke volume and cardiac output. On the left, the Doppler beam is aligned in the left ventricular outflow tract and a pulse wave envelope is positioned within one centimeter of the aortic valve. The hollow pulsed wave signal is recorded and a velocity time integral is obtained by tracing the envelope. On the right of the screen, the LVLT measurement is obtained in the mid-esophageal aortic valve long axis view with the depth reduced to focus on the valve and LVLT and enhance accuracy. The diameter is measured within one centimeter of the valve during valve opening. A heart rate is calculated by recording the RR interval from the electrocardiogram. The echo machine will then calculate both a stroke volume and a cardiac output using this data. Imaging planes for comprehensive systolic function assessment include mid-esophageal and transgastric views. Hemodynamic measurements for calculations can be obtained through Doppler imaging of deep transgastric or transgastric long axis views. The mid-esophageal four-chamber view is obtained at zero degrees. It can demonstrate wall motion of the septal and lateral walls at the basal, mid, and apical levels. It can also be used as part of a volumetric assessment by Simpson's method of discs. In this method, the LV chamber is traced in the two and four chamber views and used to calculate LV volume. At 90 degrees, the mid-esophageal two-chamber view shows the anterior on the right on the slide and inferior on the left on the slide walls of the LV at the basal, mid, and apical levels. Note that apical foreshortening is a common issue in TEE, and thus the probe should be gently retroflexed to assure adequate apical visualization. At 100 to 120 degrees in the mid-esophagus, the mid-esophageal aortic valve long axis view shows us the anterior septal wall to the right and the inferolateral wall to the left of the screen. It also shows the left ventricular outflow tract for the purpose of measuring its diameter for calculation of stroke volume and cardiac output. Advancing the probe into the stomach and antiflexing gives rise to a series of transgastric views. The basal, mid, and apical levels are all used in assessing wall motion of all cardinal walls of the left ventricle. The mid-papillary view is pictured here because it is essential for calculating shortening fraction, fractional area of change, and ejection fraction. LV systolic and diastolic volumes are measured here. 
visual estimates of ejection fraction are also done here. Evaluate the systolic function in these two images. These images both illustrate normal LV systolic function with normal wall motion and ejection fraction visually estimated at greater than 55%. The slower heart rate in the top image may lead to a false sense that it is less contractile. It is important to exclude rate from assessment of thickening, contractility, and motion. While rate impacts cardiac output, it does not affect intrinsic wall motion or ability of the heart to eject blood. This series of images depicts the impact of sudden increases in afterload on the myocardium during application of a cross clamp for aortic surgery. On the top left, we see a normally functioning myocardium with a normal ejection fraction greater than 55% and normal wall motion. On the top right, a cross clamp is applied and the heart becomes hypocontractile with an ejection fraction of roughly 40%. Note the increased LV end diastolic diameter, suggesting lower cardiac output against the high afterload. The bottom image shows the return to normal function after the cross clamp is removed. Is this heart normal or abnormal? This heart appears globally dilated and hypocontractile, both in the transgastric image on the top left and the four-chamber image on the top right. Ejection fraction is around 15%. On the bottom left, we see an end diastolic diameter of 7.2 centimeters, which is severely enlarged. On the bottom right, we see an end systolic diameter of 6.7 centimeters a calculated end systolic volume of 231 cc's and a calculated ejection fraction of 16%, all suggestive of severe LV dysfunction. Assess global LV function. The patient is bradycardic. The LV is thick but moves and contracts normally. This is another example of a rate making the LV appear hypocontractile. Systematic assessment of LV function will help you avoid this pitfall. Finally, we will turn our attention to preload assessment briefly. Preload is defined as the length of muscle fibers measured in diastole. Clinically, end diastolic area correlates with preload. One technique for assessment of preload is to observe for an echocardiographic increase in end diastolic area and cardiac output in response to a volume bolus. In the assessment of cardiac volume, in general, end diastolic area of 8 to 22 square centimeters is considered normal. Less than 8 square centimeters is considered hypovolemia, whereas an area of greater than 22 square centimeters correlates with hypervolemia. End diastolic diameter should increase with volume boluses. Of note, these generalizations must be correlated with baseline volumes. Baseline dilated ventricles will not conform to these average measurements, nor will baseline small ventricles. In summary, using multiple imaging planes, calculations, and modalities will aid in a thorough assessment of LV function.